girls can't go to school and you know. We're live. Good morning, Revolution. We're live. I don't know this new fangled setup they have, Anita and Michael. <laughs> um, anyway, good morning, Revolution, to you and all of our friends out there in Facebook and YouTube world. We are live and kicking and back. We were on hiatus, uh, Anita and uh, Michael, for three weeks. Yep. Vacation. Ah, Revolution doesn't end. How can you communists take vacation? Well, we were educating the next generation. Of yeah, we were running a revolutionaries. School. You were running a school. Well, did this, you run the school, or did the school run you? I heard the school <laughs> ran you. A little bit of both, but it was it was awesome. We had about forty-seven students here from around the country. You know, any, everywhere from New York to Indiana to Ohio. Arizona, Colorado, Florida, Virginia, they came from all over Michigan. Um, and we, you know, got that theory, Marxism, Leninism, and we put it into practice. We went marching with um, striking mine workers from Alabama, with advocates for Medicare for all. We went tabling and we did recruitment drives out in um, Inwood, up in Inwood, uptown in Manhattan, and then in uh, Union Square as well. So it was very productive, 10 day long school. Uh, as Anita said, educating the future leaders of the party and getting to know each other. That was, that was the most fun part. So Anita, you taught in the school. Uh, did you, Marx once said that the educators need to be educated. <laughs> so I was learned... in the prepar preparation for such schools. You learn so much because you have to do research and reading, reviewing. And so how, how did you find it? Exactly. I, I was I really found the school uh, inspirational. I wasn't there for the whole time, but for about five or six days of it. And it was just, I mean, meeting all those young people. And, and you're right, preparing. I felt like I had the hardest classes to teach. And that was just the, you know, basic dialectical uh, and historical materialism. And I but I really uh, enjoyed over the last few months reviewing um, the material and just putting it together for a kind of a you know introductory class, so that went really well, and and I think students could really relate the theory to the modern world, and they really they want to talk about theory, which is wonderful. So, um, but I think I think Mar um, Michael's right. I think uh, well, I don't know whether he said this exactly, but I think the most exciting times were when they were out on the street for the mine workers and in the other demonstrations. I think that is just so inspirational to do something like that together in their in their YCL t-shirts together. It was just re really inspirational. And uh, I'm sure lifelong friendships have been forged as well that week. That does happen, lifelong friendships, relationships, you know, pretty soon you might see babies running around who <laughs> will become young communists at some point. And, That's right. But uh, whether or not they're babies, they'll be comradeship. And, and some of, of us will become consistent dialectical materialists. <laughs> Michael, did you get some consistent, uh, I'm not sure what an inconsistent dialectical materialist <laughs> is, any, but did y'all grab hold of dialectics during that school? I think we did. And I think um, it wasn't immediate. I think um, Anita's right in that she may have had the most uh, difficult in terms of like material, but I, I, I like that it was positioned in the middle of the school between all the other small d democratic questions. So, you know, we talked about the labor movement, we talked about women's equality, LGBT rights, uh, the fight against racism, the environment. And I feel like it was perfect that it took place in the middle of all that so they can kind of put it together. And we finished out the school um, with Vijay Prashad giving a wonderful class on the socialist <laughs> Uh, movement today, you know, in all the different socialist countries and in countries that are like moving in that direction. We also had a guest speaker, uh, the president of WUFTI, uh, the World Federation of Democratic Youth, Aritza Rodriguez, who taught a class on imperialism. And so they got it all. It was 10 days, not a lot of people got much sleep, but it was a lot of fun. And I feel like they did grasp not only materialism, but also the small d democratic uh, questions and um, also, you know, the issues surrounding the fascist danger and imperialism. Well, that's good. I, I hope that that's the case. And I hope that 
all of the people who participated in the school pay attention who they're talking to, you know, because you have to talk in a language uh, that uh, people understand and and can really relate to. And, and you also have to, I don't know how to say this, but be cognizant of where you're at and, and, and who you're talking to. Hmm. I remember Gus Hall telling a story about a comrade in Texas who went to a memorial service for uh, another a, a comrade who died. Um, and apparently he didn't know the person uh, very well, or they were only remotely acquainted. And after the sermon and after the singing and after the uh, prayer, they they asked if anybody else wanted to say something about the deceased. And this old comrade got up and said, well, I don't have anything to say about the deceased, but I would like to say a couple words about culture. And he went on to give a, he was just kind of, you know, a little bit out of it and didn't realize where he, uh, where, where, where he was. But we are in these United States and today is Friday the 13th oh. and uh, a day of omens and it's gonna be a bright day for us. We're not superstitious. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't believe in hocus pocus and all of that kind of thing. No. Um, but we do admit as dialectical materialists and leaders, that there's some things that we don't understand yet. But knowledge is a process of becoming. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, as we go forward, if we are to survive, uh, we will know more. Speaking of survival, COVID looks like it's back for good. Michael, uh, are we gonna be, they got the Delta variant out now and the folks in the red states are perishing at alarming rates, uh, and the folks in the blue states are, you know, more and more vaccinated, but there are upticks there as well. Um, what do you think? Are we, is this the new normal? Um, it, it's going to be the new normal, and this, you know, it's science. You can't deny science. As materialists, as communists, we have to accept science. We have to get vaccinated, and we can't be selfish about it. You know, I don't like shots at all. I look at it and I pass out. Can't get my blood drawn without passing out, I'll be honest. But I got this vaccine and I urge everyone around me to get this vaccine because it's gonna keep um, evolving, uh, mm -hmm. like we see with the Delta variant and other variants that are gonna come around until uh, we get to the point of um, herd immunity. We're not there yet. You know, I, I understand in some areas they were close, but, um, and it's a shame, you know, there is such a, a overwhelming quantity of vaccines in this country because so many people have refused it. And I remember talking to a friend from Brazil the other night and she said, you know, we would die for vaccines down here. Mm. You would, you have no idea what we would do for those vaccines to be down here because when you get COVID in some areas around the world, it's a death sentence, you know, because of the, the way the variants are and healthcare systems are. And so we, we have to remember that. We have to, you know, get vaccinated for those around us and uh, think long-term because how many people are sick of wearing, you know, I'm sick of wearing a mask, you're sick of wearing a mask. Well, the best way to stop wearing masks is for everyone to get vaccinated and, you know, get back to normal. And that's not gonna happen until, you know, we all start trusting the science and, and the medical professionals. Well, it looks like a needed to herd immunity is, you know, that's not gonna happen. No. I would have to goddamn population refusing to, I mean, Right. And I think I, I'd like to say a word about Governor DeSantis in, uh, in Florida. He sends his children to schools that uh, have mask requirements, uh, private schools, but he has passed a, a law and really, uh, you know, proclaimed it um, that prevents mask mandates in any other school system in Florida, which is just like the epicenter of the Delta uh, variant. I mean, they're, they're the hospitals are just overwhelmed with patients right now. So um, I just I, I just think it's so despicable. Um, and really, there's there's blood on his hands, uh, definitely. And it's just it's just a shame what's happening in Florida. They're just also the epicenter of misinformation about uh, the vaccination as well. So it's a sad situation down there. Florida, Texas, and you know you name Louisiana. it. Those Republican dominated states, they got hell to pay. 
Mm -hmm. They got hell to pay. And, uh, but it looks like, you know, uh, also it's affecting the blue states. There's a increasing cases in New York. We had at the school, for example, we had a situation there where, where we had to require at the advice of healthcare officials um, who we consulted, everybody to wear masks because the cases were going up, Michael. And, and uh, we had to issue a statement, the Communist Party statement on the website saying, yo, y'all got to wear masks. You got to get vaccines. Don't play with this thing, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and uh, Michael, so I don't know, when you go to your club meeting, uh, everybody's going to have to have a, ma a, a, a vaccine or they shouldn't get in the door. Mm -hmm. That's the way it has to be. Yeah. And at the school, everyone was vaccinated. We didn't let anyone in the school without uh, vaccines. But despite that, we still required them to wear a mask. So. Is your club still meeting in person, Anita? And, uh, or did you go back to Zoom? We, uh, we met last Sunday night and we decided we'd go back to Zoom for the future uh, because it was, um, it's just getting too dangerous. And, um, and we're, uh, there were a number of comrades who were really reluctant to come out to a, an in-person meeting. So we want to include them. So we'll, uh, we'll definitely have the next one on Zoom, but we're still meeting in our little coffee house um, on Friday afternoon. So I don't know, um, there are outdoor tables there. So that'll be safer. Everybody has to have a vaccine if you're meeting in person. Mm -hmm. That should be democratic centralist rule. That's right. And if you're not, don't come to the meeting. Mm -hmm. Because why? Why is this important? Because you can carry the virus and not know it. You can be vaccinated and then you give it to everybody else right. that you come in contact with. So you can be a carrier. Mm -hmm. So it's a threat to the person who's not vaccinated and it's a threat to uh, everybody else. But I have a feeling this thing's not going away ever. And that we're gonna have to reacclimate to a, a new situation uh, where, you know, there are surges and ebbs and flows. Um, and, uh, you know, partial mask mandates and all of this uh, for the foreseeable Mm -hmm. of future and it's going to have economic and political uh, uh, consequences as as well uh, we're going to have to dig deeper into that with respect to what it means for our uh, politics sexism isn't going away either <laughs> and the governor of new york what uh, cuomo how'd you like that Apology. I mean, I'm just... not very, uh, not very effective at all. I mean, he he really is not taking any responsibility. He doesn't get it. Uh, he only resigned because he would have been impeached, surely, uh, if he, um, if he, if he did not resign. So I think he saw the that he had no allies left, and it was time to go. So uh, you know, uh, hopefully, he's off the stage for well, he's off the stage for the time being, anyway. Uh, and New York has a new governor, its first woman governor, and she has had nothing really to do with the governor. So it's really a, uh, starting out with a clean slate uh, on that side. So um, and someone from, uh, you know, Buffalo instead of, uh, you know, um, the power centers of, of New York State. So it'll be interesting. I say good riddance. You know, we've been marching around for over a year. Uh, against some of his policies, you know, from the police state to how he handled the pandemic in certain ways, you know, that could have been handled a little bit better. And then the sexual harassment, you know, these charges, it's just, it's unacceptable. Unacceptable. There was also the COVID situation in the nursing homes that uh, mm -hmm. drew fire from uh, by how they were allegedly covering up deaths and you know, polishing the numbers and all of that uh, uh, kind of thing. But he acted like, you know, he's only a year younger than me. Hmm. Um, and I'm 64, I think. I forget sometimes. Sometimes I say I'm 63, 62. One morning I woke up, I thought I was 61. But he's only a year younger than me. And um, but he acted like, oh, I didn't know the line. 
Mm -hmm. Move. Bullshit. Right. You know, you knew you weren't supposed to be gone. You were using your position and power to uh, get sex, sexual favors. And there's no two ways about it. And he did it all after the Me Too movement started. Mm -hmm. Most of that, which meant that he felt that, you know, this privilege of male sex of privilege that you just feel entitled to, you know, it's true. They feel entitled to uh, do whatever they want because they're in power and, and, and the hell with everything else. Well, you can't do that anymore. No. So I hope people draw the uh, a lesson because we have experiences with it um, all up and down the street, in the party, outside the party. And we have to be constantly vigilant against it. We have to fight against it. all of its manifestations. And sex is a mass supremacy, toxic mass. It's an insidious thing. Mm -hmm. And you can't fight it unless you realize that it resides in you. Men, it's not somebody else's problem. It's your problem. And you're victims, but you're the carrier. You're the bearer. Mm. We are the bearer. And Michael and uh, people, people have to get used to recognizing that, and we have to maintain uh, eternal uh, vigilance. Joe, that's a good. Anita. That's a good point about age is not an excuse. Uh, you know, I think uh, you know there's. Uh, sometimes I, I bristle at people talking about boomers, but I don't think being a boomer is an excuse to get away with sexual harassment, just like it's not an excuse for uh, Northrop in uh, Virginia to have done blackface in the 80s. I went to school in the 80s in Virginia. That wasn't that wasn't a permitted thing. That wasn't OK then. And it's not OK now. So I think um, people our, in our age group have to make sure we're not using that as an excuse not to not to not to remember people's pronouns or not to uh you know do a lot of things that we we tend to say well we're, we're old we got used to doing it this way so we have to really uh, examine our own behavior too absolutely and and be consciously aware of it and thinking about it you know mm -hmm. it, it's vigilance and and constant activity is the cure, um, I think. Um, and it's going to remain that way because this is not a problem that is generated exclusively by capitalism. Patriarchy is, existed forever. You know, really, it's not, you know, capitalism adds a quality to it, but it's not, uh, you know, it's a long history almost as long as the history of the species. Not quite, but almost. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, Afghanistan is in the news. Kabul, they say the battle for Kabul is emerging. September, maybe. They've taken over the second, the Taliban, the second largest city. Kandahar, is that the name of it? Was Biden wrong to pull the troops out, Michael? I don't think he was wrong to pull the troops out. You know, we should have never really been there in the first place. We meaning the United States military, which isn't really we. I should have said U.S. imperialism. Should have never been there. Definitely shouldn't have been there for 20 years. But it is uh, kind of a repeat of Vietnam and the fact that, you know, the United States is pulling out and, you know, here it's falling to you know, everything that supposedly the United States was doing for the good for democracy over those 20 years, it all went down the drain. And now these you know, horrible, uh, you know, the, the Taliban, which doesn't let young uh, girls go to school, you know, makes women cover their face. They're back at, we're, they're, we're back at square one. Um, and there was an interesting article in the People's World. Oh, this would have been in a, April of this year about the socialist years of Afghanistan. And I'll never forget the picture in that article and it's a picture of uh women in afghanistan in the 80s um you know with the, the afghan flag you know from the socialist era behind them and they had you know the modern haircuts and they were dressed and and 
you know, clothing that let's say uh, would be universally acceptable, um, you know, and wasn't humiliating. It wasn't, you know, covering anything up. And so um, it was just, it's, it's unfortunate that the United States put, even back in those days, so many millions of dollars into, you know, um, tearing down the socialist project that they had built up and then spent so many years uh, this time around since 2001, um, you know, occupying the country, bombing, you know, areas, uh, bombing funerals and saying, oh, we thought it was the Taliban. We thought it was Al Qaeda, but it was a funeral gathering. You know, it's just a shame. It's a shame. And so do I think uh, Biden was correct in bringing out the troops yet? But, you know, that's something Bush should have never sent them in the first place. It's something Obama should have fixed. It's something, you know, Trump should have fixed and so forth. So that's the way I see it. You can't import or export revolution, Anita. Uh, yeah. No. Um, and you can't. Cre Go ahead. I was going to say, I agree with Michael about everything, um, except I want to be careful not to tell people what to wear, you know, what what makes you feel comfortable, whatever makes you feel comfortable, you should wear, you know, but I don't I don't want the men in, in the Taliban either, uh, you know, telling women what to wear. But um, but I think the women. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's up to and I, I think women what women need is that a uh, chance to have education and full participation in civic life and and in political life. So I think that is really something that's going to be the struggle over the next generation in Afghanistan. So um, I, and I think I think it can be. I think if I remember correctly, doesn't Taliban mean youth? And I think the the Taliban right now does not represent what's new in in uh, you know emerging in Afghanistan. And I I hope I hope there will be transformations. Uh, that won't be interfered with uh, by the United States uh, government and its imperialist um, allies. I think it might mean student. Student, uh, oh, right. Okay. Student. Yeah, I think it might mean student, which is kind of close <laughs> to being you. Mm -hmm. Most students are you, not all. Um, but, uh, well, you know, uh, they helped create the Taliban. And it wasn't just the Taliban. They did the same thing in many of these countries, in Egypt with the Muslim Brotherhood and, and the other places. In order to counter the secular nationalist movements, uh, some of them socialist oriented, that were developing. They didn't care, you know, as long as you could defeat the left, maintain control of the oil, <laughs> that was the decisive thing. And uh, and now there's there's hell to a uh, pay. That country's gonna have to deal with its own issues. Its people gonna have to address because they weren't importing democracy or exporting democracy. They were. You can't do that. You know, and not every political dispensation is gonna look like you know the U.S. Congress or the British Parliament or the French. That's not the universal form of, you know, get over it. It's not, I'm not for, you know, feudal dictatorship, don't get me wrong, but, you know, these, these governments and societies and economies are, have their own pace of development and change and, and uh, that has to be understood and, um, yeah, the United Nations is going to have to have a role, you know, the world community on addressing some of these global issues of inequality. Um, okay, we're going to end with this. We got criticized the other day for cancel culture. We condemned the cancel culture on the right, but we didn't condemn it on the left. Everybody, this person said, is guilty of cancel culture. And uh, Michael, um, so are you ready today to accept that criticism and to condemn cancel culture on the left? I think, yeah, cancel culture, I, I don't know exactly what they mean by that, 
because the cancel culture that I'm familiar with in the media is that of, uh, of the right wing. But, but I use the example of a painting that was done by a communist in the Bay Area of a slave and a master or something like that and, and the depiction they didn't care for. But it was done by a left, you know, Marxist communist artist. And, and so the others, old heads had to step in and say, no, 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 this is no, you know, what it, Hmm. That was one of the examples that they gave. Or oh, another one is Huck Finn. You know, Mark Twain was a great Democrat, anti-slavery hmm. kind of guy, anti-colonialist kind of guy. But in the Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn theory, he uses the N-word repeatedly. And, uh, and so I remember 25, 30 years ago, people were, oh, have Huck Finn in the public schools. It's a racist book, you know, that kind of. So I think they're referring to that kind of, Anita, that kind of. Yeah. What do you think? Should, should, uh... I, I agree. I mean, I think everyone should read Mark Twain. Uh, you know, I think he, he was a great writer and, uh, and he was, uh, he was channeling the, the dialogue uh, of his time. I don't think we should cancel Mark Twain. Um, so I, I I'm not sure. I don't I don't even like the term cancel culture. I think it it was it was originally it comes from Black Twitter as I understand it, but it was uh, you know um, taken on uh, by the Tucker Carlsons of the of the uh, far right and um, and made into something that it's not. So um, I think surely there's some accountability that that people are facing now that they might not have in a, in the pre social media age. Um, you know, when we find out, uh, you know, we, when information about people becomes, uh, you know, comes out and people want to change their opinion, I, I think that's accountability. Um, and I don't think it's on, on the left or on the right. You know, I, I, I think what Trump did to Mark Sanford was was cancel, uh, was cancel him. And, and, and a lot of what the far right does is, is canceling people. So I don't, I don't, I don't like it as a term, really. Accountability is what I'm talking. Did we have we canceled uh, Andrew Cuomo? I guess so. So I don't know. <laughs> well, <clears throat> me, I'm unrepentant on the issue. <laughs> I'm for cancel culture. I'm for canceling the culture of white supremacy. Mm. Cancel that. Cancel the damn thing completely. I'm in favor of doing that. It will be a, a benefit to humanity and to world civilization to cancel the culture and, and to cancel that, you gotta cancel the economy that produced it, mm. number one. <clears throat> and I am against the hypocrisy of the right wing talking about cancel culture. They are the past masters of cancel culture. They canceled, I was just thinking that today, you know, they got all everybody south of the border speaking Spanish. That's cancel culture because every all of those people had their indigenous languages. Mm -hmm. Got all of us speaking English. They canceled the cultures of the various African nations. Don't even know where we came from. Don't even have a name that we can really say is our own. You know, that's why Malcolm put X <laughs> behind because he don't. You know, and can't, who knows who Paul Robeson is today? Young people don't even know who as popular as. I'm probably Michael Jackson. Michael, who is the equivalent of Michael Jackson today? You know, give me somebody's name. As you know, and cancel, they, they're experts at it. And in order to practice, you have to have the means of canceling somebody's culture. We don't have the means of doing that. Well, what? We don't occupy the commanding heights of the cultural means of production. Hollywood studios, TV stations, publishing. We don't have any of that. No, that's who, no. get to get out of town with that kind of nonsense. I mean, come on. You know what it sounds to me? It sounds like Trump. There are uh, good people on both sides. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of logic that's behind it. When you equate I'm against stupidity. I understand people make errors, 
but it's not the same. You can't you can't equate, you know, what a system of canceling people's identities and and languages and cultures and politics. You can't equate that with the resistance to it. It's not the same. I'm sorry, it's not the same. I'm unrepentant. We can still read uh, Huck Finn though, I hope, Joe, right? I was taught Huck Finn. River I was taught Huck Finn. symbol of freedom <laughs> in Mark Twain's book. Mm -hmm. Mississippi is a symbol of freedom. Or it's like I with the, Mark Twain. it's like with the um, the statues that are being torn down and the statues that are being replaced in, in the Capitol building, you know, that represent Confederate, you know, that praise these Confederate figures. We don't have to have statues of Hitler around to remember that that happened. We can study in the history books there, you know, there's plenty of movies about it, documentaries. You don't have to have these symbols that glorify them to remember that it happened. That's right. You're right. And Mark Twain is his therapy. You should read his stuff. You, 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 you need to take a, uh, some, have some aspirin there because you start laughing, you won't be able to stop. He's, he's hysterical. <laughs> he's a wonderful writer. Yes. And, and then read his King Leopold's soliloquy um, about what happened in the Congo. If you want to talk about cancel culture, look at what happened in the Congo. Mm. Read Mark Twain, King Leopold's soliloquy. Get out of town with that nonsense. <laughs> I don't want to hear it. That's it for this week. We'll see you next week. Good morning, <laughs> Revolution. Y'all have a good weekend. You know, stay safe, wear a mask, get that vaccine so you can stay strong and, and stay in the fight. See you later. <laughs> All right.